Hi everyone, this is Professor Casey again. Um, today we're talking about Chapter 18, adapted from George Emery Shy's America, A Narrative History. And um, this particular subject is one that deals with uh, two parts, in fact. Um, we're now turning our attention back to the South post-Reconstruction uh, for the period of time that lasts for about the last 15 to 20 years of the 19th century. And then we're turning over to um, the West and looking at uh, everything that has to do with the Indian Wars, the conflicts between Native Americans and the federal government in the last portion of the 19th century and everything. Uh, so this is really kind of a, a two-part thing anyway. Okay, So we're going to take each one individually and um, kind of look at it all as a whole. So concerning the South, we've already established in chapter 19 or chapter 16, I beg your pardon, uh, during Reconstruction, the South is still struggling with the fact that it has lost the Civil War. Um, for many individuals, the Civil War has not ended ideologically speaking. Okay, and so individuals are still um, still pushing back very much so against the federal government, uh, especially now that Congress has come in and um, imposed the the Reconstruction system on the South. Um, and especially now that the Democratic president, uh, Andrew Johnson, has been impeached. Okay, Remember, Johnson's rhetoric um, becomes increasingly white supremacist over time, and uh, as soon as Congress determines that he is in opposition to congressional reconstruction, they impeach him. Uh, they don't remove him, but they remove quite a bit of his power. Okay, And so for the federal government to kind of push him aside, um, it ends up causing the South to retaliate quite a bit. Uh, against the federal government. And for a lot of former Confederates who survived the war, who got all the way to the end of it, um, the war is something of a romantic lost cause, right? They don't really express any kind of remorse over what's happened. Um, they miss the good old days, right? The days when whites actually had control over the South, the, the slavery system, the cotton industry, and all that kind of stuff. And so they have this weird sense of personal nobility that's extremely prickly. Um, they believe that you know, this is uh, the war has been spun uh, by this point into what they call the war of northern aggression, right? They don't actually uh, put it out there as the the South being in at fault for anything, right? They believe that their system, their way of life, has been infringed upon by the North uh, in some weird tyrannical way. Okay, and so Southern life uh, aggressively looks backward. Okay, it's extremely. Um, you know, retro, uh, retroactive, retrofitted, however you want to put it, right? People start to look specifically at the antebellum South as being the ideal, at least for, again, the white planter elite who have survived the war, okay? Many of whom, if not most of whom, have been completely disenfranchised by the war, right? People have lost com everything, okay? So if you're a wealthy landowner before the war or even during the war, uh, once the federal government comes in, once the Union armies come through and sweep through all, much of the South, um, people start to lose all their financial holdings. Uh, in some cases, they lose their property, they lose just about everything. So there's a lot of, lot of soreness over all this. Um, and moving forward, the South really is still looking backward the entire time, and it takes it the better part of 100 years to actually catch up with the rest of the country in terms of the economy, in terms of diversifying itself. Um, people are still stuck with this need to you know, continue on with an agricultural economy, um, even though there are some small pockets of the South where industry um, and so forth actually does start to take root a little bit. Um, and on that particular regard, right, there are Southerners who are starting to kind of jump on the bandwagon with the remainder of the country. Um, they are eager to try to, you know, push their part of the country a little bit more forward and so forth. They try to incorporate an industrial sector of some kind. Okay. Um, and Henry Woodfin Grady, I don't know if this little X is actually appearing over his picture or not. If it is, I apologize. Um, may just be on my end. Um, Henry Woodfin Grady is the managing editor of the Atlanta Constitution. He's a, a guy who's kind of in charge of this um, newspaper in the South. And he is one of the uh, first individuals or one of the most vocal proponents of the South becoming more democratic. Okay, not necessarily a Democratic Party, okay, the South has been that for quite a long time at this point, but democratic, democratic in terms of its system. Okay, instead of actually having this good old boy system where 
um, where the Democratic Party is actually maintaining control over the South, where we have a lot of um, racial hegemony going on, where we have a lot of white supremacy going on. He says we need to try to level the playing field a little bit for everybody. We need to give everybody an equal opportunity in the South. So he's very much a progressive thinker for his time and for his plays. Um, and there are some white Southerners who realize that they have no other recourse at this point, right? The cotton industry doesn't make that big of a comeback, uh, even though it does come back a little bit over time. And so there is a greater need for more efficient farming. People start to incorporate certain areas of industry into what they do. Um, and we also start to see the installation of different schools and universities in the South as well. Okay, this is the time of the A&M universities begin to pop up here and there. And so some people start to go specifically out for vocational training. They try to actually um, establish a trade for themselves in addition to or in place of farming. Okay, because at this point in time, um, agriculture is becoming much more uh, industrialized. It's becoming much more... Um, uh, I guess incorporated, um, right? People are actually growing things specifically to sell them at market. And so small farmers and individuals who are still trying to grasp the, the whole um, concept of, uh, of Southern agriculture are starting to fall by the wayside, right? They're not making as much money as they could before. And of course, at the very center of all this, the, the issue of white supremacy is still very, very much in place. Okay? And that, um, unfortunately, as we see today, has still not fully gone away. Right? It is still a, a big issue in the South, geographically speaking, more so than in most of the rest of the country. Now, in terms of the industry sector in the South itself, okay, uh, for the last 20 or so years of the 19th century, um, the main industry that starts to filter more into the South is the textile industry. Okay, uh, This was really the only foothold that had its place in the South uh, before and during the war. Right, We had certain factories that were making uniforms for soldiers um, right, and trying to actually take these areas um, into the South more so after the war per, because we have uh, access to electricity now. Okay, We have uh, alternating current motors and so forth to where we can actually build factories wherever we want to in the country. Um, before this, most of the time these factories had to be built near a main water source or something that could actually uh, provide you know, hydropower or something along those lines, something that can actually um, create some kind of an electrical current or you know, some means of operating the machinery, okay? And not all of that was available in the South readily enough, okay? We still operated on steam power up until this particular point in time. And so by the time we get to these last 20 or so years, we have over 400 uh, textile mills in the South, uh, and they're starting to outpace New England in terms of what kind of output they can come up with. And the other thing, too, is we also have a very large contingency of women and children working specifically in the textile industry, but also just in industry in general. Okay? There's a lot of um, issues that are still going on during this time where the government hasn't quite caught up in terms of passing legislation to make sure that uh, machines are inspected, to make sure that workplaces are safe for workers. Um, this is long before any kind of workers' compensation benefits or anything like that. So accidents are very, very commonplace. Death is very, very commonplace in places like this. Um, and uh, as you can see here, right, 70% of the mill workers in the South are under the age of 21. Okay, and uh, a large uh, reason for that, at least the, the reasoning given during this time period, is because women and children have smaller hands, uh, and specifically children, right? Their hands are not as dexterous as an adult's hands are, but if you have a specific problem with uh, a gear or something, or if a piece of textile is caught in the machinery somehow, a child can very easily fit their hands into a smaller opening, aperture of some kind, and remove the clog the child's fingers might get cut off in the process, okay, but it's an occupational hazard at this point. And so now that the cotton industry has gone under and it's gradually making a comeback, there's a, a much greater demand for cotton products. Again, we had 60% of the southern economy embedded in the cotton industry, and so once that actually disappears, it leaves a massive vacuum, okay? And so there's a lot more of a demand for it now, and people are having to try to catch up with that as best they can. Another area that uh, begins to pass into industry during this point, and something that was uh, really only kind of an independent thing before then, I guess, is tobacco and cigarette sales. 
Um, to, the tobacco industry had been in existence, of course, since Jamestown was founded. Okay, and so now we're actually moving into mass production of cigarettes rather than just actually having tobacco for uh, for you know smoking it in a pipe or something along those lines. Right, it's we're, we're getting into mass productions of this. And Washington Duke is the name of the man who actually. Um, begins the uh, the Duke's Cameo Cigarette Company uh, before and during the war. Um, and by 1872, his cigarette factory is producing 125,000 pounds of tobacco on an annual basis. Okay? And it makes him a massive amount of money. Okay? His son is actually the one, though, who gets into doing most of the advertising for the time period. Uh, James Buchanan Duke uh, is the one who starts to actually perfect the, uh, the mass production aspect of things. Okay, He actually produces um, you know, advertising campaigns like what you see up here at the top right with these little uh, tin cigarette packages and, and so forth. Uh, and so he is the one who actually begins to market it more actively uh, to the population. Um, and by the time we get to 1890, he's actually doing what a lot of the robber barons were doing uh, only a few years before. He's incorporating horizontal integration into his system. So he's actively buying out the competition and runs a virtual monopoly on the cigarette production company in the U.S. Uh, okay, so about 90% of uh, the production in America goes through the American Tobacco Company. Uh, coal production is another aspect, right, for about the last 25 years or so of the 19th century, okay, we start to get up to about 49 million tons of coal produced on an annual basis. Um, and part of this, again, we talked a little bit about in Chapter 17 in terms of the, um, uh, the different uh, trade organizations or different, um, what am I trying to say, organized labor specifically, right? Uh, you know, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, areas like that, there, were, there are a lot of coal mines and coal fields. Um, these workers are actively campaigning for better rights, for safer working conditions, because a lot of them are getting sick, okay? Um, again, we've, we've talked about the, the concept of black lung, right, where you inhale so much coal dust that it essentially calcifies your lungs and ends up suffocating you over time. So this is a very, um, it's a rapidly growing uh, uh, institution at this point. We're still using steam power in certain areas. Electricity hasn't caught on 100% okay, and doesn't do so for quite a long time. So coal is still very much a relevant thing and people are beginning to produce it more and more. And the steel industry is another area that starts to gradually um, pop up in the south as well. Okay, Pittsburgh at this point has been the main um, hub of steel production in the United States and it's part of what ends up getting us um, more technologically advanced in terms of our military over time as well. Um, the arms race that builds up to World War I from between the United States, Great Britain, and Germany is largely in part due to the steel industry. Um, we are we actually own such a, a massive in-house production company with Carnegie Steel at this point in time that we actually end up catching up with and outpacing Great Britain as a direct result of it. Um, but getting back to the South here, Birmingham in Alabama uh, becomes known as the Pittsburgh of the South because there are a lot of iron deposits around it. Okay, and so people start actually mining iron ore and taking it to foundries that are actually built in the area and producing steel as a result. So steel is becoming less centralized uh, and uh, there are, it's easier to uh, transport it to shipyards and so forth in the South. Okay, so it starts to spread out our ability to you know, maintain these production areas and eventually over time defend our own shores. And lumber is another area after 1870 that starts to outpace uh, a lot of areas, specifically the textile industry by the time we get to the 20th century. Um, lumber is uh, largely due to the fact that most of the South is completely um, uh, uncultivated at this point. Okay, A lot of the areas in the piney woods, uh, in some of the swamp areas and so forth, it's not always conducive to doing much else, right? You can't really settle anybody there because the ground is you know, unstable and so forth, but there's so much overgrowth in terms of the trees that sometimes it's easier to just go in and reap the natural, um, you know, natural resources and so forth. And the failings of the New South is not necessarily something that's easily covered in one single slide or even one single um, uh, lecture like this. Um, but it goes without saying that by this point in time, the South is the least um, developed area in the entire country. Okay, it's it's the area that has been so backward mobility 
wise, okay, uh, that uh, it, it takes it so long to catch up with everybody else. Okay, there's very few cities in the South, so there's not really an urban presence to speak of, except in some coastal areas like South Carolina. Um, there's not many schools because remember the the plantation system and so forth wasn't really conducive to even uh, planters sending their sons to to universities. Okay, universities are really there more so to teach people how to do jobs that are part of the uh, the middle class in the north, right? Being a teacher, a banker, a doctor, etc. Um, and so there's really not much aside from becoming basically literate, able to read some kind of a uh, a ledger of some kind. That's really the only thing that causes people to want to go to school in the South at this point. And now, because of all the disenfranchisement that's gone on because of the end of the Civil War, it's the least prosperous as well. Okay, People are still stuck very much in this uh, agricultural mindset, and uh, whites in particular who have been in charge of most of the South are stuck in this area, and they're continually keeping African Americans in this position as well through the sharecropping institution. So it's kind of a, a forced dynamic, I guess. Uh, to give you a little bit of a sense of the, the numbers in terms of their economy, the, the South per capita only makes about 60% of what the rest of the country does. Okay, So it's still very, very impoverished. Southern whites make about 50% of what non-Southerners make. So if you live in the North, right, anywhere North of kind of the Mason-Dixon line, anywhere, uh, you know, in uh, above Kentucky, for example, up in New England or that particular area, or if you live out West, right, even in California or someplace like that, chances are you are making more money than if you live in Mississippi or Alabama or any of those places, okay? And to add insult to injury, if you are black and you live in the South, you make only one third on estimate of what Southern whites make. Okay, so uh, again, there's such a massive, massive discrepancy in terms of income, and uh, most of it has to do with institutionalized racism, okay? and it and it continues in this vein again all the way into the 20th century. The other problem too is that the South, even though it tried to portray itself as being able to be independent during the war, um, it relies very, very heavily on imports from the North. Okay, So individuals who are trying to get primary um, uh, resources of any kind, if they're trying to get food, if they're trying to get um, you know, clothing and goods, if they're trying to get farming equipment, whatever, all of it is made in the North Okay, because the South doesn't really have the factory uh, production going on. Okay, the South is still an agricultural producer, and so it does produce some food of some kind, but even things like uh, grain, uh, packaged meat, and so forth, which is just now starting to become a thing during this period, all of that is produced in the North and even in the Midwest. Okay, so the South actually produces a lot of cash crops like cotton and tobacco, but nothing that can really be consumed very heavily. And of course, cotton itself is going into a stage where it's not very profitable anyway. Okay, uh, it, during the war, uh, or even just immediately thereafter, in the last five years after the war, it was about 11.77 cents per pound, and by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, it's dropped down to only 7.72 cents per pound. Okay, so even if you are still in the cotton industry, if you've managed to keep that going for yourself, you're still losing money. Okay, so people are gradually beginning to move away from this for very obvious reasons and to try to get into the more industrialized sector. And by the time we get to the dawn of the 20th century, it's estimated that about 70% of farmers living in the South are having to rent land from somebody else. Okay, so this is part of what is keeping this, um, this sharecropping and share tenant uh, system in, in, uh, in business. Okay, right? There's a, you know, a small portion of people who are actually able to own and maintain land uh, by virtue of the, the rent that they're gathering from somebody else. And so the crop lien system, again, this is something that we is very similar to sharecropping. Okay, it's similar to what we talked about already. Um, crop lien system, though, is not necessarily operated specifically by uh, a former plantation owner or a planter. Right, it's it's operated typically by a merchant. Okay, someone who actually has one foot in the agricultural sector and perhaps one foot in the industrial sector as well. Okay, these are the people who actually sell the product at market. Right, but they actually have other people work the land that they own. Okay, so right, they they're a little bit more. They're a manager more so than a planter themselves. Okay. So they're the ones who provide food and clothing and fertilizer and seed and perhaps some of the tools to someone willing to work the land for them. 
Okay, and they do it in exchange for a portion of the harvest that their farmers do. Okay, so sometimes it's kind of like a it's kind of like a form of passive income. Okay, they they manage it as kind of a landlord, um, but they're a little bit more distant from it. And the small farm owners themselves are the actual planter landlords who own the farmland itself. Okay, so this might be a little bit more of a striated system. You might have a merchant who does business with a small farm owner, and then the small farm owner might actually have people working on the land themselves. So it's, it's very much, there's a lot of middlemen in, in between all this. Um, and the small farm owners are the ones who typically are a little bit more dishonest. Okay, they may be the ones who fudge the numbers from one year to the next, who say that you know you owe me a certain amount of interest from last year. You know, they they come up with all kinds of excuses to make more money. And the sharecroppers are typically the ones who are kind of at the bottom of the heap here. Okay, um, mostly black Americans at this point who are essentially uh, they don't own much else except the clothes on their back. Okay, they might only be able to offer labor to the situation. They might not even own the tools to do it. They might not have access to the seed if, if someone doesn't give it to them. Uh, many of them are former slaves who have not been given anything since emancipation occurred. Okay? And quite often they have to forfeit about 50% of the entire harvest to the landlord, okay? which may not leave them with much, okay? depending on how much they're able to grow. Right? Remember, a lot of the South at this point has had depleted um, nutrients in the soil okay? because it's been used so much, and so the th soil may be so thin that they only get you know, um, a few pounds of food, and, that they're, and then off of that they have to shave 50%. Um, and the other thing too is about 80% of African Americans living in the South at this point are still working on farms. Okay? There's still not a whole lot of upward social mobility to speak of. Okay? You might be someone who is able to get to a coastal city and maybe work in a, a different trade there. Right? You might be able to get work as a blacksmith or a silversmith, a barrel maker, a tailor, something along those lines. But quite often the vast majority of individuals are still stuck working on farms the way they and their families have for generations, perhaps. The, um, the similar position to a sharecropper is a share tenant. And when I say similar, I mean it's virtually working the exact same capacity, but this is typically um, has to do with a racial disparity okay, between uh, blacks and whites. Okay? Most sharecroppers are actually black at this point and are kind of kept in a position of poverty by the individuals who own the land and the, the merchants who are willing to dole out the, the supplies and so forth, share tenants tend to be the white contingency of this group. Again, they have the same basic responsibilities, right? They still work the, the farm, they work the land, uh, they might not have very many belongings themselves. Occasionally they will actually have something like the tools to, to do it with. They might have uh, an animal to help them like a horse or a mule. Um, and they, they are essentially renting land in the same capacity. Sometimes they're able to pay rent in cash. That's another big difference too. Okay? African Americans don't have a lot of access to cash or money during this period. Um, and the other thing too, the thing that keeps the institutionalized racism going here and the wage discrepancy is that share tenants typically only have to pay 40% of the harvest, whereas black sharecroppers have to pay 50%. Okay, so again, this is a, a very, uh, very, very um, thinly disguised form of institutionalized racism. And just looking at it on the face like this, it's obvious that there's a big difference. Um, and as I said before, this entire system is self-defeating because of soil erosion, because there's not really a crop rotation system going on. And so quite often the land itself is worked quite literally to death. Right? Nothing will grow there over time. And to make matters worse, if you are a, a black sharecropper living in the South, quite often the landlord will force you to grow only a specific type of crop, and quite often it's a crop that you can't even feed yourself with. Okay, So cotton or tobacco are typically kept as the main crops. Occasionally you're allowed to grow your own personal garden or something like that to feed yourself and your family, but even then there's nothing really to guarantee that the landlord is not going to come through and try to take that as well. And so if you are a tenant living in the South and you're just basically giving up part of the harvest, you might not use any of it yourself, okay? if, especially if it's tobacco or cotton. There's not really a whole lot of incentive to keep the land healthy. Okay? The, the landlord can't really kick you off if you only are able to grow a little bit okay? because they're the ones who are constantly keeping you working it. And again, 
with all this, the more work you do on the land uh, with the less amount of reward, it keeps you in a constant cycle of debt. Okay, and especially if you're having to buy tools or seed or something like that on credit, um, especially with merchants in this particular situation, um, there's not really a whole lot of hope for you to get out of this. Okay, they might charge you an insane amount of interest to the point where you can't really pay off what you um, what you borrowed. Now that we've gotten all the way through the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments during Reconstruction, the aftermath of the 15th Amendment is, uh, again, kind of a backward process here. Okay? By the time we get past 1877 and into the next couple of decades, there is still a very heavy sense of what has been uh, coined as the term Negrophobia in the South. Okay? Um, Southerners are still uh, white Southerners, that is, still have this weird sense of um, uh, lizard-brained terror, I guess, of African Americans because of the amount of authority that they were able to gather during Reconstruction, and there's still that leftover sense of uh, terror that one day they're going to all be armed, they're all going to rise up and kill all the whites in the South, okay? And it's a, it's a terror, again, that's left over from the Enlightenment era, from the beginning of slavery, and all the way through it. Okay, people are still constantly terrified that there is going to be some kind of payback for what has happened to African Americans. Uh, and, of course, rightly so. Right? There's been tons of torture, tons of death, tons of dehumanization, and so forth. And so whites are slowly, even though they don't really have maybe a sense of guilt or, or remorse about all this, there is still a sense that they are going to be punished for it. And to make matters worse, during the 1890s, this is the period in time when science begins to gather an even greater foothold in, so, in society, in sociology, in medicine, and so forth. And unfortunately, the racist ideologies that are left over from, um, from the Enlightenment period, right, people trying to categorize race in general, race being a social construct more so than an actual reality, um, people try to continue that forward and try to justify it through scientific means. Okay, so people start to look at things like craniometry, right, the shape of the skull. They try to look at um, physiognomy, right, the shape of the human body. And people actually try to categorize individuals based on what is quote unquote the ideal human, right? What in quote unquote is an actual human being, right? So people are actively trying to justify racist tendencies during this period. Um, and as we get into the 20th century, we'll actually see how directly this connects with things like the Holocaust, with Nazism, and with a lot of other um, racist ideologies that continue into that. Okay, so there's the dehumanization aspect of all this is, uh, is still very much alive and well through all this. And now that we have science backing it up and science is taking a more prominent foothold at this point in time, it makes things that much worse. Okay, it's all the wrong, um, all the wrong people able to push forward these ideas. And this is also coupled, again, as I said before, with the fact that during Reconstruction, African Americans had a lot of opportunity, at least for a brief period of time, more so than they had it ever before. Okay? They're able to enter into politics, they're able to enter into civil service, to maintain their communities for the first time outside of slavery. Um, and so some of them do manage to gain quite a bit of wealth. Some of them do gain a lot of success in politics. And there are white individuals who have been disenfranchised by Reconstruction, and they're very bitter about it. And so now they're basically turning around and trying to take their revenge on successful African Americans. So it's a constant back and forth throughout all this period. And especially now that we have the end of Reconstruction, we have the end of the Civil War, there's an entirely new generation that's been born after emancipation has occurred. So there's an entirely new precedent, a whole new dynamic that exists in society. Okay? So, and these two contingencies, white and black, both have different um, opinions about how they want to see society succeed in the future. Okay? African Americans want to see African Americans succeed, and whites are divided about this. Okay, Some want to have everybody on equal footing, and some want white supremacy all over again, just like the antebellum South. Okay, So there's a lot of divisiveness during this point in time. The Mississippi Plan is something where we see uh, kind of this 
backward mobility again when it comes to uh, the 15th amendment especially okay um, Mississippi starts to introduce these constitutional amendments once the state government goes back to uh, being controlled by the Democratic Party and it's essentially seeing the black codes make a, a reappearance again okay um, we see an instance where they're trying to disfranchise African Americans while keeping the 15th amendment as an official um, official decree okay so again state governments can't override a federal government right we've, we've established that precedent here um, and the Civil War is is kind of the <laughs> the last say in that but instead of actually directly attacking the 15th amendment and saying that a state government is going to try to actively outlaw African Americans being able to vote they circumvent it right they exercise some kind of a loophole to essentially disable anyone who tries to vote okay for one thing, they actually introduce a residence requirement. Okay, you have to live two years in the state and one year in the local district in which you want to vote. Okay, so that's kind of a, a basic rule. It doesn't seem on the surface like there's too much wrong with it. Mississippi specifically, though, starts to disqualify African Americans who are convicted of certain crimes. Okay, and the problem here is, is if you are an African American and you are living nearby, if someone wants to accuse you of a crime, especially if you are white living in the South, there is still the precedent where um, African Americans in many instances are not even entertained as, um, as testifying against a white person in the South. So if you try to you know, convict an African American of a crime if, and you're white, it's much easier than if it goes the other way around. Okay? Almost impossible in, uh, in retrospect. And of course, you have to pay taxes on time, whether you have the money to do it or not, right? And of course, the white state governments are the ones that actually set this precedent. And also, if you want to vote, you have to pay a poll tax to do it, okay? So if you go to vote, you actually have to pay to vote. And if you don't have the money to vote, then you don't get to vote, okay? So if you are white and you're only giving 40% of your crop, right, you have a little bit of extra money than if you are black and giving 50% of your crop. Okay. So again, it's embedded into the system as being institutionally racist. And quite possibly the most um, bold and bald-faced way of doing this is to require a literacy test to be able to vote. Okay? If you're African American and you are illiterate because you've been uh, constantly denied access to education your whole life and you still haven't learned to read, you were automatically told that you were not allowed to vote. Even if you can recognize the name of a candidate on a, on a poll somewhere, you still are not able to do it. Okay? You have to be able to read and understand the Constitution. Okay? Many people uh, who have English as their primary language in the 21st century read the Constitution and are not able to understand it. Okay? So imagine being already illiterate uh, and living in the, the 19th century and trying to understand it. Okay? It's, it's a very, very different world and extremely difficult to navigate. Um, and literacy tests have not necessarily gone away since this time period either. Um, in many instances, uh, there are certain state governments who have tried to do this even into the 21st century, try to make it to where you have to be able to read the Constitution in English and understand it. Um, a lot of it has to do with anti-immigrant sentiment. By 1898, Louisiana begins to insert what it refers to as the grandfather clause into its state constitution. Okay, so if you've ever heard of someone being grandfathered into something, this is where that saying comes from. And what it has to do with is if you are a white person and you are illiterate, okay, and if your grandfather or your father could vote in January of 1867, okay, even if you are illiterate, you are allowed to vote. Okay? So in other words, it's a, it's a complete uh, double standard here. Okay? If you are white and illiterate and you have this little extra thing with someone in your family could vote, then you are allowed to vote, but if you're black, and even if you are, if you have family members, all of your family members are literate except for you, you are automatically disqualified. Okay? So it's a very heavy form of institutionalized racism. And by 1910, other states in the South, Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, Alabama, and Oklahoma, they all begin to adopt this policy. And again, it's just a way of exercising a loophole around the 15th Amendment. Okay. They still say, if you can teach yourself to read, we'll let you vote, but they will do everything they can in the process to prevent that from happening. Um, 
And this goes all the way up to ch the chain to governors. Okay, Governors like Benjamin Tillman, he was a South Carolina governor here, specifically says that the state's problems are all due to, quote, ignorant, lazy Negroes. Okay, So this is very, very heavily embedded in the South, and the more... Um, the more systematic authority that white supremacy is given, the worse it gets. Okay? And unfortunately in the South, things continue to get worse before they get better. Um, and Tillman is not above using uh, systematic and physical violence to prevent African Americans from voting. Okay? He will continually use things like the Mississippi Plan or the Grandfather Clause and that sort of thing in the system itself. And you know he might have friends who wear white sheets on the weekend to show up at the polls and actually start to threaten people physically. Okay? So there's all kinds of ways that people actively try to keep white supremacy going in the South. And it has its effect. Okay, By 1900, black voting in the South is down by 62%. Remember, in the 1868 election, we had half a million African Americans voting for President Grant, and now all that has been completely dismantled because of all the institutionalized and physical racism. The other big element, of course, that occurs during this point in time is the actual implementation of segregation in the South and also throughout most of the rest of the United States. Okay? Um, between 1875 and 1883, it was an official decree that if you were a state or local government who required segregation as part of your state constitution, then you were in violation of federal law. Okay? Then you were violating the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Okay? By 1883, though, there is enough support by Northerners even, Northern whites, to try to reintroduce segregation in the South that this is actually becoming more and more legitimized, okay? and it gets worse and worse and worse. Okay? We start to see the introduction of these so-called separate but equal facilities, okay? and state laws, again, can find ways of circumventing uh, certain laws like this, but the Civil Rights Act is the, ma the last real uh, bastion of hope, I guess you could say, to continue to allow um, universal access to these types of things until the case of Plessy v. Ferguson comes along. Okay? And this originates in 1896 in New Orleans. Okay? And it involves an individual named Homer Plessy. Okay? Homer Plessy is referred to by the census at this point in time, which is also very inaccurate, as what is called an octoroon. Okay? An octoroon is an individual who has one-eighth African ancestry. Okay. And if you have even a very small portion of um, uh, mixed ethnicity okay, in your bloodlines anywhere in all this, you were automatically dubbed typically a quote-unquote mulatto on the census date. Okay? And that being said, you were automatically lumped in with African Americans instead of with whites. Okay? You were automatically put into that category. And as a direct result, when he is told to leave a whites-only rail car in New Orleans, he refuses. Okay? He tries to argue that he is partially black, he is not fully black, but um, of course, as we know, this system of racism continues through this point. Okay? And so the judge who actually prosecutes the case against him, a guy named John Howard Ferguson, fines Plessy $25. Okay? Now, again, this is a, a controversial uh, situation here. If Plessy had simply paid the fine, if he had been able to, we don't know that really, if he had been able to pay the fine and go his own way, things might have turned out differently. Again, there's no way that we can know that either way. But what he decides to do instead is he turns the corner and says that he is going to appeal his case to the Supreme Court of Louisiana. He's going to try to argue that he doesn't have to pay this fine on principle. And what happens is rather devastating. Okay, because what happens is the Louisiana Supreme Court ends up ruling on behalf of the judge instead of Plessy. Okay? And the Supreme Court, remember, represents the federal government. Okay? Even though it's the Supreme Court of the state, it has direct ties with the federal government. So if the Supreme Court legitimizes this particular local law in one place, it legitimizes it everywhere. Okay? So now segregation can actually continue to be adopted by local areas in the South based on individual states' rights. Okay? So we're taking a much bigger step backward now. And this is when we start to hear the term Jim Crow become a, um, 
a more widespread term for the laws that are put in place that are overtly racism, racist in the South. Okay? And the term Jim Crow had been around for quite a long time by now. Okay? By the 1830s, it was used as a racial slur along the same lines as the N-word is today. Right? Um, but during this time, it's actually uh, it refers to uh, this little characterized um, African American that you see up here at the top right. Okay, it's supposed to be a a disabled uh, African slave used for minstrel shows. Right, this was supposed to be some kind of almost like a cartoonish character, uh, someone who is uh, overtly ignorant, who conforms to stereotypes used by white supremacists during the period. Very dehumanizing. Okay? And so the Jim Crow laws become associated directly with that, and it's another form of insult and dehumanization. And so this leads to a, a separation of just about everything in social life that you can think of. Okay? Public restrooms, water fountains, even churches become segregated, right? whites-only churches versus black churches. Um, and funeral homes and even cemeteries in the South. There are still areas in small towns you can go to today, even here in Texas in particular, where you might find a black cemetery. And, and it was established during this time period, and only blacks could be buried there, and only whites-only cemeteries as well. Okay, so it's, it's still a, a very unfortunate legacy that, that continues to this day. Most of the time, these over time, these cemeteries have been actually integrated uh, uh, gradually, but even in some communities in the South that still have not let go of some of this, it is still very much a reality. And of course, the physical violence has ramped up as well. Okay? In the last decade of the 19th century, it's estimated there's about 188 lynchings on an annual basis in the United States, and 82% of those occur in the South. Okay? So, and that being said, okay, that is still a large number, obviously, for the South, but it means that this is not necessarily um, isolated to the South. Okay? There are instances in the North, in the Midwest, out West, where people are being lynched uh, because, again, just because um, slavery has disappeared on the surface, right, in an official way, does not mean that racism has disappeared either. Okay? So this is, um, things are still, there's a very much a, a lingering um, aspect to all this um, is uh, is very different. Okay, it's different from one case to the next. In most instances, it's obviously a very um, a mandatory thing for a lot of African Americans to actually leave the South altogether if they can. Okay, um, and many of them don't have the means to do so. They don't have the funds. They don't have the protection to do so. Okay, uh, essentially, if you were an African American living in the South, you were living in hostile territory. So if you try to pack up and leave on your own, you might be pursued. Okay, you might have um, a plantation owner who tries to actively pursue you, hunt you down, and bring you back. Right? It's 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 very very similar to the days of slavery in that regard. But if you do stay behind, you still face the threat of being oppressed. You face the risk of being lynched if you do something even very, very small um, in, in opposition to the, the established system. And the primary anchors for black communities in the South during this period are churches, okay? because they provide a lot of social services. Okay? They have the chance for individuals to uh, have upward mobility in terms of leadership roles. You might be able to gain some political status, at least in the church, if nothing else. And just a sense of dignity, just human dignity at the center of all of it. Okay? Um, I mean, if you live in a society where the vast majority of individuals are, are constantly waiting for you to make some kind of a mistake in their eyes or waiting for a reason for them to blame you, you look for whatever recourse you can. Okay? Um, and again, the, the dehumanization of this cannot be uh, overstated. Okay? So there's, uh, there's an obvious need for, for some measure of dignity and some measure of consistency in this life. And your book makes the argument, and again, take from this what you will. Okay? I, I use this phrase quite a bit. Take from it what you will, but your book claims that um, somehow Jim Crow laws had some sort of silver lining to them. And that over time, it caused, through necessity specifically, caused African American communities to build up their own independent, grassroots funded um, areas of life. Okay? So things like black owned insurance companies, black owned banks, barber shops and hair salons, funeral parlors, uh, social clubs, fraternities, churches, all these kinds of things. 
there are instances where you have, of course, black historically black churches and neighborhoods and so forth. Whether or not it is a good thing in the long term, okay, in terms of being quote unquote separate but equal in all this, again, take from it what you will, okay? Individuals will have individual um, responses to this, okay? Uh, in my own personal opinion, Jim Crow seems like it doesn't have a whole lot of silver lining to it because of all the horrible things that go along with it. But again, there is this aspect where um, African American communities in many instances do remain strong and they do manage to make, um, you know, make a name for themselves, make a footing for themselves. So again, take from it what you will. Um, one d good thing that does come out of all this is the National Association of Colored Women. Okay, this is founded in 1896 by Mary Church Terrell, and it's specifically organized as a, a way of providing social services for individuals, specifically in the black community, who are already at a disadvantage in, in society in general because of the Jim Crow laws, but also further disadvantaged by their socioeconomic status. Okay, So anybody who is an elderly individual, perhaps who doesn't have a family who can take care of them, anyone who has a disability of some kind, if they have um, if they've been born with a, an intellectual disability, if they've been injured um, on the job or something like that, if they can't find work, and just anyone who is underprivileged in general, right? If you're an orphan, for example, okay? So she is a wealthy enough African-American lady who she's willing to provide money and, and services and so forth to individuals who are in this situation. So this is one example, I think, of what the author of the textbook is trying to, trying to get at here. Okay, that there is a there is an internal sense of responsibility for the community more so than anything else. And so now we can actually look at specific case studies of individuals coming from this time period who represent the ideas I think of what the author is trying to say the the pushback and the first instances of black civil rights activists in the United States during this period. And the first one is Ida B. Wells. Okay? Um, Ida Wells is actually uh, a very interesting case because she, she has a lot of uh, upward social mobility throughout her life. Okay? Uh, she's actually born into slavery in Mississippi toward the, the very beginning of the Civil War. She, of course, survives it and extends past it and eventually lands in the middle class. Okay? She uh, is taught in segregated schools in Memphis, Tennessee, and eventually over time becomes a, an educator in her own right, a journalist, and a social activist as well. Um, one claim to fame that she has that doesn't get a whole lot of attention these days is the fact that she is the first African American to file suit against discrimination. Okay, because she is actually denied a seat on a rail car. Okay, you could argue that Hom that Homer Plessy does the same thing here, but she actually does it specifically on principle during the period of Jim Crow laws. Again, this is after segregation has been put into law. Okay, this is the same year that it's put into law. And the Tennessee Circuit Court actually rules in her favor, but the Supreme Court is the thing that overturns it. Again. The difference between the federal government endorsing something and a state government endorsing it. Because the Supreme Court represents the federal government, it overrides the state government and ends up allowing it to continue. She becomes an editor of the Memphis Free Speech. This is a newspaper that's specifically focused on the issues of African Americans living in the South. It's supposed to act kind of as a uh, an editorial or an expose of everything that's going on because in many instances, the North is not really very aware of the type of violence that's taking place in the South. Okay, You might have one or two newspapers in the North that are printing this, but a lot of white newspapers are kind of turning a blind eye to much of this. And she becomes an anti-lynching activist in 1892 after three of her friends are actually lynched. Um, and in fact, I believe if you go onto the Library of Congress website, you can actually find um, a pamphlet that she began to produce uh, after this point where she was act actively going against lynching and trying to stop it in the United States completely. Um, again, because of the dehumanization that's going on and because of the, quite simply, the, the candidness in which it was taking place. Okay, um, Whites in the South were viewing this almost the way that a, a medieval village would start to view a public execution. Okay, It was a almost like a... Um, obscenely enough, it's like a picnic, right? People would actively come out and watch this occur. 
And so with this haphazard attitude that people were taking toward it, it seemed like no one was really taking it seriously. Okay, so it's an extremely dehumanizing uh, way of actually putting someone to death for no other reason than the fact in many instances that they were simply black. And she is also one of the founders of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which of course still has presence here in the United States, very much so, and constantly fights for civil rights. Booker T. Washington, of course, is another very famous individual from the time. Uh, he himself, of course, is not only an educator, an author, uh, a public speaker, he also eventually becomes a presidential advisor, uh, one of the first uh, black Americans to do this as well. Uh, like Ida Wells, he is born into slavery in Virginia, and he is uh, unique in this regard in that he has a, well, not unique in, in the grand scheme of things, this happened to many people, of course, but he has a mother who is a slave, she was a plantation cook specifically, and his father is an unnamed white man that he never uh, meets, never learns anything further about, except that he, he knows that he is uh, simply a white, or a, a light-skinned black man. Um, he eventually enrolls in one of these agricultural institutes in the South, right, trying to kind of get people in, uh, into a more um, industrialized and trade-specific society, right, moving away from the agricultural thing. Uh, the founder is a man named uh, Samuel Chapman Armstrong. He's a guy who kind of starts to act a bit of, uh, as a mentor for Washington, starts trying to, you know, get him more into taking on a leadership role here. And Washington is already interested in education from a very young age. Again, he is um, he's born during slavery and lives all the way through the Civil War and claims at one point in, uh, in his book, Up From Slavery, that his idea of paradise is being able to enter into a, a schoolhouse. He, he wanted education more than anything else. And so eventually over time, um, Armstrong actually recommends Washington to become the president of the Tuskegee Institute in 1881. And this is something that is virtually unheard of during this time. It's a massive leap forward. Okay? Um, so for him to get that kind of an endorsement and be put in that measure of a leadership role is a very, very big thing. And of course, Washington becomes a, a big social figure, right? He becomes a, a celebrity, nationally speaking, because of this. Okay? And of course, it gets him you know, love from certain communities and hate from other communities. Of course, the Tuskegee Institute becomes known as a very prominent place, a, a, an historically black school that is a center for vocational training, uh, for discipline, and so forth. Individuals like George Washington Carver are specifically associated with, with this. Um, and Washington himself becomes a controversial figure in the civil rights movement during this period um, because of his uh, stance when it comes to the Jim Crow laws. Um, he makes a, a speech in 1895 uh, in which he specifically says that African Americans do not need to fight segregation. Okay? Uh, he says instead they need to self-improve and continue to be uh, dignified and to maintain this internal sense of community um, almost in complete isolation from the white community. Okay? Become economically self-sufficient. Okay? Remember this is still um, the, the primary desire for individuals who were emancipated and he uh, was a member of this group when he was only about 10 years old. Okay? So he, his, his life and his lifestyle, his outlook very much reflects uh, someone who's had the experience of being a slave. Okay? Um, but again, it gets him a lot of uh, pushback. Okay? Uh, he says that any effort to try to challenge white supremacy in the South is only going to lead to making it worse. Okay, he's lived through Reconstruction. He's seen uh, what white supremacists in the South have done any time that the federal government has tried to impose new laws to prevent it from continuing. He thinks that it's a, uh, essentially it's more trouble than it's worth to try to push back against it. So controversial in that respect. Okay, um, not not everybody agrees with him. But at the same time, too, he actually funds lawsuits against segregation, against lynchings. He tries to actually provide funding for, uh, for public schools to try to avoid violence and that kind of thing. So he's constantly doing things behind the scenes, even though as a public figure, he tries to maintain this kind of unassuming persona. His primary rival in all this, in terms of, um, you know, competition in terms of what message he's trying to convey is W.E.B. Du Bois. Okay? 
And Du Bois has actually got a very, very different background from what Washington and Wells do, and that uh, Du Bois is actually born a free man in Massachusetts. Okay, so geographically speaking, he has a very different background, a very different experience of of life and growing up in the United States during and specifically after the Civil War. Okay, du Bois is a member of the contingency that was born after the war ended okay? and born into a geographic area of the North where slavery didn't exist during his lifetime. And it's not until he actually goes to Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee um, that he actually experiences prejudice for the first time. Okay, so a very big portion of his early life is spent kind of in isolation from some of this. And so his reaction to things is very different. Okay? He becomes the first African American to earn a PhD from Harvard. Okay? Sets a very big precedent by doing that. And he's very proficient as an author. He writes over 20 books during his lifetime and lives all the way up to the civil rights uh, movements in the 1950s and 60s. Okay? He actually lives to be um, uh, almost 100 years old. And he is the one, again, who is directly in opposition to Booker T. Washington's ideas because he accuses Washington of being what he calls accommodationist. He thinks that Washington is making too many excuses for whites and for African Americans and all this. Um, from an excerpt from Up From Slavery, Washington specifically says that he does not blame his white father for abandoning them. He believes that his father, too, was also a victim of the slavery institution in addition to him and his mother being victims of it as well. Um, and Du Bois, of course, says you're making way too many excuses for whites here. He says whites have done unforgivable things to African Americans in this country, and he says that there, there shouldn't be this level of forgiveness. And uh, he says that segregation uh, should not be a thing. He says that civil rights should be uh, pushed forward, right, that we need to do away with all this separate but equal stuff. And specifically, he says the speech that Washington makes in 1895, he refers to it as the Atlanta Compromise. He says that Washington is basically a coward for saying that you need to be servile to whites and keep your head down in post-Reconstruction South. And for many people, unfortunately, that is the reality. If they try to push back, they run the risk of being lynched. Um, and so Du Bois kind of has a little bit of a, um, a disconnect here between that. So um, to... to Put it in more of a, a modern 20th century perspective here, Du Bois and Washington are as diametrically opposed as Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Okay, So again, both moving toward a, a civil rights ideal in their own minds, but perhaps with different outcomes and certainly with different methods. Okay, Du Bois is very much like a Malcolm X, and Washington is very much like MLK. So again, similar but different in certain regards. And instead, what Du Bois advocates is that blacks should actually openly challenge uh, Jim Crow, it should openly foster stronger leadership, should try to build up dignity in the face of all this stuff by actually having uh, successful black entrepreneurs, successful black universities, and so forth, successful black communities that should do better than what whites have allowed to be done over time. Okay, so again, very, very different ideas, but perhaps with a similar goal in mind.